Hello, and welcome to your lecture on the Greco-Persian Wars. Grab your student notes and use them to follow along and fill in any blanks that you missed in class. When King Cyrus the Great of Persia died in 530 BC, he left behind him some pretty big shoes to fill. His son, King Cambyses II, was not able to fill them. But Cambyses II's successor, King Darius I, who ruled Persia from 522 to 486 BC, found those shoes fit pretty well. King Darius I was an able administrator and an excellent general who reorganized the Persian Empire, turned the army into an elite fighting force, and expanded the empire to India in the east and to Greece in the west. To Greece in the west. The Persians, in the end, were unable to defeat the Greeks. And if you've taken a look at Greece during this period of time, you'd have said, what? Those people defeated the Persians? Because Greece at this time, although it had emerged from the Greek Dark Age into which it had plunged during the Bronze Age collapse, although it had adapted the Phoenician alphabet to its own language, and in the 8th century had written down the Iliad and the Odyssey, two of its greatest works of literature, the fact of the matter was, that the Greek city-states were still much more like a collection of fighting siblings than a worthy foe to a mighty empire. Their different cultures and political systems meant that despite their shared language, despite their shared religion, despite their shared sense of history, they often fought. They fought with each other, they fought within themselves. To an outside eye, they were weak and divided. Of the Greek city-states, the two most powerful were Athens and Sparta. The two were as different as night and day. The city-state of Athens valued thought, valued the arts, valued individual liberty for her male citizens. The Athenians were the ones who invented democracy. And while Athenian democracy was different than what we think of as democracy today, the fact of the matter was that it involved more citizen participation, not less. The Spartans, on the other hand, valued the group above the individual and the state above all. Sparta was the top priority in every Spartan's life, more important than your family and definitely more important than you. The Spartans prized action over speech and prided themselves on being tough, powerful warriors. All Greeks from all city-states, however, viewed the Persian advance with trepidation. Here is the Persian Empire under Darius. Here is Greece. The Greeks knew it was only a matter of time before the Persians tried to swallow them up, too. The first Greco-Persian War took place in 490 BC. After Athens supported a failed rebellion in Persian-owned Ionia, King Darius I decided it was time for revenge, and the Persians attacked the Athenians. The Athenians knew that the Persians were coming, and they knew that they were vastly outnumbered. So they sent a runner, Pheidippides, down the 140 miles to Sparta to beg the Spartans for help. But Sparta refused. Sparta was in the middle of a religious festival and couldn't possibly spare anyone until after the festival was over. Sparta also possibly did not want to mess with the Persians, thinking that if Athens supports Ionia, Athens gets attacked, might mean also Sparta supports Athens, Sparta gets attacked. They didn't want to risk it. So whether it was because of the religious festival or whether it was because they did not want to tangle with the Persians, Sparta refused to help Athens. Athens was on her own. And so Athens screwed up her courage and met the Persians at Marathon. Marathon was a small town on a bay surrounded by mountains and marshes. The Persian infantry, that's the Persian foot soldiers, came in by ship. But the mountains prevented the cavalry, that's the Persian soldiers who would ride on horses, the mountains prevented the cavalry from meeting the infantry and supporting them. Even without their cavalry, the Persians easily outnumbered the Greeks at least two to one. But the Greeks were not without their advantages. They were more heavily armored, for one. For another, while the Persians were simply fighting to gain more territory, the Greeks were fighting for their homes and their families. This small army the Athenians had managed to muster at Marathon was the only army they had. There was nobody back home to defend Athens. If the Athenians lost at Marathon, they lost everything. 
And so after arranging their line four men deep in the center, eight men deep at the sides, the Athenian army charged. The Persian archers let loose, but still the Greeks charged. And the Persians watching this people run at them through a hail of arrows were terrified. Who are they, they wondered. Are they insane? They weren't insane, but they were desperate and determined. The Persian army broke through the Greek center, which was, they say, only four men deep, and they ran through. Then something happened that the Persians had not anticipated, because when they broke the Greek center line and ran through, the two wings of the Greek army, those wings that were eight men deep, began to fold around them and block their escape. And when the Persians realized what was happening, they panicked and they rushed back to their ships. Not all the Persians made it back. Many fell on the battle, many drowned in the marshes. But the ones that did make it back to their ships beat a hasty retreat. In the end, the Athenians didn't just defeat the Persians, they crushed them. 6,400 Persians died that day, and only 192 Greeks. Now the Athenians, jubilant, turned their attention back home to Athens, where they knew the people were waiting, terrified, knowing that everything had depended on this battle, and not knowing whether their countrymen had won or lost. So the Athenians sent their best runner, Pheidippides, back the 26.2 miles to Athens to deliver the news of victory. And legend says that he ran so hard and so fast that when he reached Athens with the word victory, Nike on his lips, he died of exhaustion. But his message had been delivered and his sacrifice was not forgotten. And even today, the longest race in the Olympics is called the marathon in his honor and is 26.2 miles long. The battle at Marathon had saved Athens and proven that the Persians could be beaten. But the Athenians were not so foolish as to assume that the Persians would never return. And they immediately set to strengthening their navy and their army. It's a very good thing that they did because in 480 BC, King Xerxes of Persia, the son of King Darius I, decided to finish what his father had started and invaded mainland Greece. This time, Sparta responded to Athens' plea for help and Athens and Sparta and several other city-states banded together to stop the Persians. One of the first major engagements of the Second Greco-Persian War was the Battle at Thermopylae. Thermopylae, a narrow mountain pass, was one of only two ways through the mountains into southern Greece. The other way was a hidden mountain path, and the Greeks decided that the Persians were unlikely to know about this path, and so while they defended it a little bit, they put most of their effort into setting up defenses at Thermopylae itself. At the Battle of Thermopylae, as at the Battle of Marathon before it, the Greeks were vastly outnumbered by the Persians. Including the 300 Spartans who led them, there were only about 7,000 Greeks. While numbers for the Persian army vary widely, there were up to 300,000 Persians ready to take on those 7,000 Greeks. King Xerxes of Persia was understandably confident. In fact, he thought he might be able to win without fighting at all. So he sent a message to the Spartan King Leonidas, who was leading the Greek forces, and he said, lay down your arms. To which the Spartan King Leonidas bit back, come and take them. The Persians did their best. For two days, they assaulted the Greek forces at Thermopylae, and for two days, they could not push through. They might have had 300,000 people in their army, but they couldn't fit 300,000 people into that narrow mountain pass. They had to constantly feed more men into the pass, and the Greek forces easily dealt with them. And then the Greeks were betrayed. As long as the Persians were stuck funneling men toward the Greek encampment at Thermopylae, the Greeks could hold them off, could perhaps even hold them off until they got reinforcements and defeat the Persians once and for all. But then a Greek shepherd in exchange for a substantial reward showed Xerxes the hidden path 
through the mountains. And so the Persians were able to circle around and attack the Greek army from the back as well. With the Persian discovery of the hidden mountain path, King Leonidas of Sparta knew that the battle was lost. But he thought there might still be a chance for the bulk of the army to escape and get back to the rest of the Greek forces and live to fight another day. So he ordered the main force of the army to retreat while he, the remaining Spartans, and about 1,000 of their allies stayed behind to fight off the Persians while the army escaped. And so 1,300 men held off the entire Persian army for one more day while the army retreated to safety. And while accounts vary on whether or not the Spartans' allies surrendered before the day was done, the fact is that the Spartans fought to the last man. The Battle of Thermopylae is remembered as one of the greatest last stands in all of history. But a last stand, however courageous, is still a loss. The Greeks lost the Battle of Thermopylae and the Persians poured into southern Greece. The Persians sacked and burned Athens, and while the Athenians had evacuated it in time, they wept to see their city go up in flames. The Greeks retreated to the island of Salamis. The Greeks were vulnerable at Salamis, and they knew it. If the Persians decided to surround and besiege them, if the Persians decided to kill them slowly through a war of attrition, the Greeks would be lost. They needed a decisive victory, and they needed it now. Well, trickery had served the Greeks very well at Troy, and trickery would save the day against the Persians as well. The Athenian general Themistocles sent King Xerxes of the Persians a message in which he said, I know that the Greeks are going to lose. I can see the writing on the wall. I'll tell you what, you attack now, I'll switch sides, and I'll help you fight the Greeks and win the day. King Xerxes had no trouble believing that the beleaguered Greeks would turn sides just to save their own hides, and so he decided to attack. He sent his Persian navy against the Greeks immediately. This, of course, is exactly what the Greeks wanted. To give you a visual, this is a Greek trireme. A trireme is a long, narrow ship, sometimes no more than 15 feet wide. It's powered by large numbers of oars, and it has a bronze battering ram on the bow, invented, of course, by the Phoenicians. Triremes are very fast, and they're very maneuverable. They're very good ships to have in tight spaces. Persian ships, on the other hand, were much larger and bulkier. So here's how the Greeks used their tribe. When the Greeks saw the Persian navy approaching, they retreated. They pretended that they were terrified. Oh no, they seemed to say, Persian ships, we better get back to land as quickly as possible. They retreated and the Persians followed. And then they got into trouble because they were drawn into this narrow channel. And all of a sudden, this, these big bulky ships couldn't maneuver, but the Greek triremes could. And so the Greeks' smaller, more agile ships began coming around and attacking the Persian ones with their bronze battering rams, and the Persians could not escape. In his play, The Persians, the Greek playwright Aeschylus, who was at the Battle of Salamis, tells the battle from the Persian point of view. Ship struck ship, ramming with bows of brass, breaking away whole prows. The Greeks began it. Men on opposing decks let fly their spears. We resisted at first, holding our own, but soon our ships so massed together struck each other head on in the narrow strait. Bronze beak ramming bronze beak, destroying oars and benches. The Greeks then circled around in perfect order and struck, and hulls were tumbled wrong side up, and the sea was no longer seen for all the wreckage and floating bodies, and all the shores and reefs bobbing with corpses. The Persians retreated with heavy losses, and they never attacked Greece again. The Greco-Persian Wars barely affected Persia. They're hardly mentioned in the Persian histories, but they were a turning point for Greece. For the first time since perhaps the Trojan War, the Greek city-states had united against a common foe and they had won. 
the Greek historian Herodotus, considered the father of history, wrote the very first history book to celebrate the victory. And Athens, confident in her cultural superiority and glowing with victory, entered a golden age. Next week, we'll look at that golden age as we discuss democracy and the golden age of Athens. See you next week.